Okay. Hi, I'm Dr. Yosef with Daring, and t today I'm joined by uh, award-winning uh, journalist Robert Whitaker, probably most well-known for um, Anatomy in an Epidemic, a great book that came out in 2010, but he's also written a lot of other great books, uh, Psychiatry Under the Influence being another one, uh, which we're going to be talking about. Uh, he's joining us today to cover a couple of topics. One is, you know, what is wrong with the way psychiatry is practiced today in the US and you know, maybe also globally? And then what I think is actually more, more interesting and something that I think about a lot is why there are so many problems and why they haven't been fixed. So I uh, hope you enjoy this. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Bob, and just, um, you know, say welcome and ask you, describe what the problems are with the way psychiatry is practiced in the U.S. today. Sure. Well, yeah. thanks, first of all, for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. You know, in a big picture way, I think you can simply, you can state it quite simply, and that is, Ever since DSM-3 was published in 1983, 1980, excuse me, when DSM-3 was published in 1980, you know, the American Psychiatric Association says it adopted a medical model. It's really a, was a disease model. Mm -hmm. And one of the ideas was that these hypotheses actually was that these were discrete illnesses. And of course, one of the hypotheses was they were caused by chemical imbalances in the brain. And then pretty soon, we and prescribers began hearing about that we had drugs that fixed those chemical imbalances, which is a, a narrative of great progress. And so we, <clears throat> we as a society, first the United States, but then this model was exported, organized ourselves around that narrative, which was a narrative of great progress. I mean, think about how complex the human brain is. Mm -hmm. And so we were being told that they had identified, researchers had identified the molecule that causes madness, the molecule that causes depression. And if that were true, I'd say that's one of the greatest discoveries of medical discoveries of all time, given the complexity of the human brain. But it wasn't true. In other words, it was a hypothesis. DSM-3 was basically created it to say, we, we're going to hypothesize these are diseases of the brain, and then we'll hope we'll find evidence for it to be so. But the hypothesis wasn't promoted to the public. And pretty soon, psychiatry itself convinced itself of this great progress it was making. If you look at the annual statements present by the, uh, the presence of the APA starting, it's all, wow, but we're making these great understandings of how the human brain works. But that's the problem, ultimately, is that we organized our thinking around a narrative that told of great progress, of uh, discovering the causes of diseases and effective treatments for, for those diseases. And if you look in the science, that wasn't the story in the science. You know, mm -hmm. the chemical balance story was falling apart. As far as the the drugs, you know, they didn't fix any known pathology. Uh, the, the benefits were, you know, exaggerated. The risks were minimized. And then, you know, there was this confluence or this capture of American psychiatry and academic psychiatry for a period by the pharmaceutical in companies. So we had both of those groups telling this story. We had the money from the pharmaceutical companies and their advertisements telling it, but we had the APA running educational campaigns as well, oftentimes in concert with the NIMH. Well, let, let me ask you this. So, so, so there's these two events, you know, one, we have the DSM, the, the DSM three comes along and, you know, previously to this, you know, when you have anxiety and depression, you know, there used to be all this language, you know, reaction, you know, and, and it was more, the way psychiatrists would describe this, you know, in, in, officially in the earlier version of uh, versions of the DSM is in ways where it could be more linked to context, contextual stresses and things happening in their life, but that gets thrown out the door and then you just get, you know, major depressive disorder, five out of nine symptoms for two weeks. It kind of just, you know, kind of puts it neatly into this box of symptoms where you lose all of that, you know, is it due to trauma or is it due to contextual stresses? You know, it's just that. And so it becomes this, you know, this, this disease model, and then there's this other part of it, you know, this, like you say, the, the story of progress when, you know, the antidepressants and the antipsychotics come onto the market and, oh, you know, there seems to be some therapeutic yeah. effect. So let's now say that anything that fits in this major depressive disorder box, you know, is this illness and we have this pill for it. And I want to ask you, so those, I totally agree that those are the ideas. How do you see them? How did you see that trickling down into the clinics and the family practice settings and the places where people were receiving care? What, what do you think changed there at that level? 
Well, you know, I think this is really important. Also, going back to DSM one and DSM two, what a huge mm-hmm. shift it was, because mm-hmm. it, with with those descriptions of reactions, you're talking about human beings that are responsive to their environment. Environment matters, right? Mm-hmm. And what, and also that the the, the the you know there are many different pathways to feeling depressed or anxious, and also, that, for example, that anxiety was quite normal. Depression happens, that sort of thing. So there was a conception there of human beings being responsive to their environment and that if you could change environments, these things could be episodic and all that. And that is so fit much more in, in, in sync with like what we know from in any sort of historical sense of conceptions and also <laughs> what you see in novels, plays, religious tracts, et cetera. We lose all that, that holistic, that complex, sophisticated sort of sense and now all of a sudden we say, oh, it's just inside the brain of the individual. It's a molecular problem. Well, that's actually a reconception of who humans are and, and how they move throughout the world. And it's such an impoverished philosophical perception or conception of human beings. It's just, it's ahistorical and impoverished. Now you asked, how does that filter down? The problem is that impoverished idea, conception, filtered into the clinics. And it also shut off communication. As you know, you're a doctor. One of the most important things of being a, having a, a, a good having a good outcome is an effective relationship with your doctor, a doctor who will mm-hmm. listen to the patients. You know, the doctor should be listening. But I can tell you how often I heard people say they their psychiatrist would no longer listen. They just said, "You have this problem. Take the pill. If you're experiencing problems, it's the disease, not the pill." So it shut off this communication as well. And then the other problem that happened is when people got worse, under on which happens to some people, of course, it was never seen as the drug. It was always like, oh, that's your conditioning worsening. So what happened with this shift at the clinical level is so often the prescribers retreated into this very narrow mindset where they stopped listening. They thought the people weren't even good witnesses to their own lives. They attributed all the problems to the disease and not the drug. So you you ended up at a clinical level with this sort of uh, impoverished reaction between the two and also the ignoring of the, the patient's experience and their life experience, their trauma. What was going on? Are, are they in poverty? Are they, you know, are they, are they grieving over something or what, you know, what's their life situation like? So at a clinical level, it led to just an interaction between prescribers and patients that was ultimately harmful. The reaction, the interaction itself was harmful. Yeah. And and I think that's probably how a lot of people feel now when they see their psychiatrist, it's like, you know, this person doesn't, doesn't really care about me. You know, they don't really care about what's going on in my life. You know, you know, it's more like, you know, uh, you're having some depression, any anxiety, any insomnia, and then, um, okay, yep, yeah, it's been going, how long has this been going on for? Done, you know, and, and, and that's and that's kind of the level of understanding they're going for. And we could talk about, you know, there's other things, there's, there's things such as the rise of, I guess, managed care insurance and the fact that there's pressures to see people in, you know, 15 minute visits now where it, it's, I mean, that model almost serves that kind of visit because you end up having a production line kind of psychiatry where you just, you know, okay, you've got this condition and and now we've got a treatment for it. And, and so there's, there's, there's that part of it, which I think also lead, you know, is why this was so useful and kind of churning people through the clinics and making it easier for clinicians. And I guess the people that are, um, you know, uh, invested in having higher flow through the clinic because of the, you know, the money that it brings in. But then the other thing that's interesting with the DSM is that, you know, they use things like it causes clinically significant distress. You know, you know, if you have five out of nine symptoms that cause clinically significant distress, and it's like, what the heck is that? You know, and and so, I mean, you've got some people who who could have you know mild mild symptoms that might clear up in a couple of weeks. You know, a young man going to a university, starting out afresh there, and it and it's it's stressful. Um, maybe he doesn't want to go to you know, classes that one week, is that, is that clinically significant distress? There's, and there's no guidance in there for what it is. They leave it completely up to people to just um, kind of go for it. And then, and then the other thing that's interesting about the DSM and, 
I guess most of the depression scales is, you know, when you have like a list of, you know, nine symptoms and you can pick five of them, I mean, they change. You can have two depressives that look completely <laughs> different and, and no one really cares about that either. Um, and so, like you said, there's this impoverished, reduced view where it's just like, okay, but why does this person look different from that one? Who cares? You know, it's, um, it, it's, it's not like, you know, this is coming from some contextual stressor or maybe, maybe, maybe you have an inflammatory disorder or something like that and an uh, autoimmune condition that's causing some depression. In all of these cases where you could co- kind of go after a root cause, it's this paradigm of like, we're not, you know, we're only interested in the symptoms. We're not interested in the cause that just, I, I guess, yeah, drives the kind of production line psychiatry that you see now. Yeah, you know, this is really interesting. You can tell me if I'm wrong here, but my understanding there was a time before DSM-3, one of the first things that psychiatrists tried to do was, or even the medical community, is rule out physical causes for these things. Because we do know that, you know, illnesses can cause depression, they can cause psychosis, it's inflammation of the brain, that sort of thing. But never. But once we move to just a symptom thing, the symptoms, of course, were mistaken for signs of an illness okay and they in other words of a known illness somehow and just going forward here is after dsm-3 american psychiatry said oh we're going to be psychopharmacologists we're going to leave the counseling to those other people basically what mm-hmm. happened that's why you got the 15 minute visits by the way I, I can't imagine going to medical school in order to just prescribe drugs to four people an hour. I mean, it seems, why would mm-hmm. you want to do that? But that's what happened. And then what I think happened within psychiatry is they had allegiance to the story, to the narrative, because in some house it made them feel like, as we know, you know, doctors treating real illnesses, and it did give them more prestige in society, and the newspapers would always be talking, they were sort of telling the story as, as well. And so what happened was, not only did they stop listening, but they stopped seeing their patients in the way you're talking about physical problems, this sort of con- context. And all I can say is the feeling was that their allegiance was to their own story, their own narrative, and maintaining it for themselves, their own belief in that story. So sometimes we say, oh, managed care is the problem because they only pay for 15 minutes. Well, that sort of came in response to the psychiatrist saying, we don't need more than 15 minutes. Mm-hmm. We're just going to check the symptoms, and then if, and then if they're changing, we'll give them some other drugs or whatever, and you get into the polypharmacy. So, in my opinion, everything went awry in 1980 when American psychiatry decided to recon- reconceive itself as basically a treater of illnesses of the brain without any scientific uh, discovery behind that reconception. And then you have all these problem, problems you're, you're talking about, lack of context, not listening, ahistorical. And, and the irony for me is, if you really wanted to be a medical doctor, if that's the way you wanted to present yourself, then the first thing you should be is really good at identifying physical illnesses that may be causing these secondary symptoms, right? Mm-hmm. Be, and, you know, we, we know all this is true. It, we'll go back to in-stage syphilis. Parkinson's disease can cause psychotic symptoms. Inflammation of the brain can cause it. Toxins can cause it. There's all sorts of biological pathways to these different, you know, poor diets, no exercise, et cetera. But all that gets lost with this impoverished, non-scientific it, it really was a, you know, as, as the American Psych- Psychological Association said when DSM-3 was published, this is more of a marketing document than a scientific document. Talking mm-hmm. about DSM-3. And, yeah. and, and that has had, you know, such profound consequences for our society because as it was promoted to the public, the public started seeing themselves this way. Oh, I'm not having a bad time because of this. I have depression or I have bipolar illness, or I have ADHD. And it's not that the schools stink and they're boring and you're given to any of that stuff. It's this is inside me. It's, so it changed who, how we think about ourselves, changed how we raised our kids, changed how parents think about their kids. So, it's, it's, yeah. And I mean, it's interesting that you say it, it, it's, it's marketing because from my experience in drug companies, you know, the, the, the DSM and that whole, conceptualization of mental illness is the greatest thing ever when it comes to, um, you know, marketing it because 
I mean, you you know, drug companies, they don't just market the drugs, they they market the illness and they can do this in a lot of different ways. And it it may it, it may be something as simple as getting behind um, seemingly grassroots patient organizations who want to promote uh, depression and bipolar and talk about how difficult the conditions are and the stigma. And in and of itself, you know, that's that's not a bad thing. But if the message is coming out of these org- organizations are very aligned with, you know, the idea that these are biological conditions, you know, and and that's kind of what they're putting out there all the time, then that, I mean, it just, it essentially, it, it floods the media with that story, you know, and, and this is kind of in the same way that the media is flooded with those stories. When you have drug companies running clinical trials, which are talking about depression in this way, it floods the medical literature in that way, because, they're the only groups that have the resources and the staff to consistently pump out these articles with these, you know, authorship lines to die for, you know, the people that are leading the field. And so it has this influence. And, you know, I see this in my day to day a lot. I was talking to a chap yesterday who developed PSSD and for his whole twenties, I mean, he was on different antidepressants having adverse reactions to them. He was irritable. He was short with friends. He had sexual problems. And, um, his whole conceptualization of that the entire time was there is something wrong with me. This is my depression. And eventually, I mean, the story has a sad end because he ends up with PSSD and he's uncertain if it's going to recover. But he looks back at this time and how he was sucked into that narrative of, you know, this is just me and my mental illness. And uh, and a lot of the mood instability have now gone away. And he's and and, and he was just oblivious to it the entire time and and just wreaked havoc on his life that that one idea in there of depression is a biological problem um so I'm, you know yeah. two things it's one is it's, it's it is a, a, a conception that says these things are chronic and not episodic right that the, the, mm-hmm. the, the law within you which is a very pessimistic thing to adopt you know after i published anatomy of an epidemic in 2010 a magazine said what do you want to write about on this and I said, PSSD, mm-hmm. it hasn't gone into the, this is in 2010. And I, but I said, I've looked at your magazine. You are, have a lot of ads by drug companies and I don't think you'll run this. And the editor says, oh no, no, we have this wall between advertising and editorial. So I interviewed a number of people at that time for PSSD, which really, there, there, it was starting to be a germ within, you know, the social media. There were, uh, you know, different groups starting to form saying, hey, what's going on? And there was Audrey Bayrick in University of Iowa, I think she was, where she had sort of brought some attention to this. So I interviewed maybe 20 people and they were devastated. And what they said, it's not just sexual dysfunction. They just felt they couldn't amount sort of real, you know, they say, oh, I see a rainbow and I don't care. I hear a great song, I don't care. And they were just feeling that so much, the loss was devastating. Now, do you think mm-hmm. that's true, man? No. No. No, it no. wasn't public. And the editor actually quit because he said, yeah, I guess we don't have a wall. <laughs> yeah. And and I don't, in a way, I don't blame the magazine. In a sense, I should have never done it because you, you, who who really is one major advertiser in all the magazines? Of course, it's, and this was a men's magazine, okay? So, you know, they had all sorts of ads from, from pharmaceutical companies. I think this is, I mean, this is a nice time to segue into, uh, I, I want to get your impression on, on, a, on another issue. So anatomy of an epidemic, if you haven't read it, one of the major themes in there is that we don't know enough about what these drugs do long term. And in fact, they may actually worsen um, worsen the underlying condition or put you in a state of uh, chronicity, where, whether it's with psychosis or, or depression. That was in 2010. Um, and I mean, that made a lot of sense to me back then. I've seen it with with patients that I treat, you know, taking them off the medication and watching them flourish. But it hasn't, I mean, it hasn't, I wouldn't say it's influenced mainstream psychiatry at all, you know, in terms of how, you know, you know, mo- most psychiatrists practice. Tell me about that. What what happened? I mean, why do you think this is not caught on at all or why why it's you know why has this been been shut down why hasn't there been more i guess studies and interest and people asking questions about that i'd love to hear your thoughts on that oh this is a great question because you know when i did publish this in 2010 i tried to gather the evidence that did 
sort of provide insight into how the medications were uh, shaping long-term outcomes. And now the one interesting thing is there were there were some responses to it. They, it, they didn't make it into the major media, but uh, people came forward and they founded something called the Foundation for Excellence in Mental Health Care. I actually helped found that. And I, I actually raised the first million dollars for it. And then I got out of it because I didn't want, and that what, what the first mission was to fund further research of this sort, <laughs> more research. And actually they did give money to Martin Harrell and Tom Job to continue their analyses. That was one of the things they did. So there was that. You do see some other studies now that have come up and been published re related to antipsychotics, related to antidepressants, related to uh, long-term effects of stimulants for ADHD in kids. So actually the information you can find or the evidence base you can find in the scientific literature is much stronger today than it was in 2010. And what was interesting for me, there were some attempts to prove me wrong in the literature, okay? So, for example, Jeffrey Lieberman and his group at Columbia, there were two different groups that looked at this question of long-term effects of antipsychotics. The first group, interestingly, Lieberman wasn't not part of that, and they just said there's not enough information on it. We, we don't know. 60 years after using this, we don't know how these drugs impact long-term outcomes. Okay, that, and, but they excited me, basically, we're going to see if Whitaker's wrong, and they just weren't willing to uh, say that, well, that hair is worthwhile or any of the other data is worthwhile, uh, you know, wondering. It's not, it's not like they said, oh my God, you know, there's nothing out there and this should be a priority, you know. It's yeah, no, like, you would think yeah. so. Well, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then Lieberman, interesting, Lieberman mm. and Donald, uh, what's his name? I transferred from MGH. But anyway, a, a group, they also did the same thing. And they said, well, you know, we know they reduce relapse, the old relapse studies. But they, they did admit that we really don't have evidence that antipsychotics improve long-term outcomes. So that's a shift from where I'm, I'm just talking within the research literature, because mm -hmm. you're, you're absolutely right on in terms of once we get into the public. Um, and then there's been like, uh, I think there's Harrow in their last thing cited seven different studies from different countries that all came to the conclusion that, that you see higher recovery rates for people diagnosed with psychotic disorders among those who get off. Now, I, I don't think that translates into a no-use model. I think it does translate into a selective use model. But that's what the, they show. There's no study they could find that shows medicated people do better than unmedicated groups in the psychotic disorders. And I think antidepressants, of course, we've had um, uh, uh, I, other studies come up that also concluded that, look, at the medicated people are doing worse. And do you know Refel Malik? Does that name ring a bell to you? Refel Malik used to be a mood disorders expert at Eli Lilly. And then he noticed, he wrote a paper saying... Is this the tachyphylaxis guy? Is that... Uh, he's, the, he's the guy, the tardive dysphoria guy. Oh, tardive dysphoria. Yeah, I have read his article. Yep. Yeah. yeah so now here's a yeah. guy from Eli Lilly saying, we're getting this increase in, tar in treatment-resistant patients, antidepressant. Could this be due to tardive dysphoria? And then they came up with this idea of oppositional tolerances as the sort of mechanism for this worsening. So within the research literature and in research community, there has been a shift. Now, no one wants to admit that drugs do harm. That's too much. That's a, that's a step too far to go. Well, I mean, that's in essence what El Malik is saying, but mostly it's like, well, we don't have evidence of long-term benefits. Now, did you see what Nasagami wrote? Uh, was it a year, last summer? He wrote, you know, he's a, at Tufts. I know. And then he went to the pharmaceutical industry and I think he left there, but I, I, I don't think I read his editorial or maybe I did and just forgot, but please. Yeah. What well, did no, he, he say? Said, Listen, there's yeah. no evidence that these, these drugs are they're yeah. just, they're not curative. They're just affecting symptoms. We have no evidence that they improve long-term outcomes. They should be used only short-term and as low doses mm -hmm. as possible. That's a break with this sort of common narrative. But that's in the, these little research corners. And we're the, Med in America is the only one that's trying to make this research known to the public. For some reason, I'm actually interested in your thoughts on this. Of course, prescribers, once they start doing things, it's hard for them to change. And once they have a narrative. And I think within the, the, the larger mental health community, first of all, they don't know this research. They're afraid of this research. It, it the cognitive dissonance has spread. It's spread to journalists because journalists don't really want to write about this either. 
it spread it spread to psychologists it spread to mental health counselors it spread throughout the society that did glom on to this narrative they organized their life around this narrative prescribers counselors families and it it, it it's really hard to say wow this could have all been a big mistake and maybe we're harming people that's the only thing i can make of it but you're absolutely right is more people are getting medicated. More people are ending up yeah. on uh, multiple drugs. What is it like? Twenty five percent of the kids that come to college now have a diagnosis, and now you have TikTok where they're all saying, "I'm bipolar. I'm ADHD. Give me my drugs." It's mind blowing. Yeah, I, c- I could share some thoughts on that, and I'd like your reflections on it. So, why is this happening? Um, that that people aren't able to to realize it. One I, one reason I think is. Um, is it is one 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 of the best ways to shut something down is just to ignore it. You know, just just because Nasir Gami publishes something in the medical literature that says, "Hey, I think we should really be cautious about chronic long term use on these things." I mean, who who even reads that? I mean, you know, maybe it's. I mean, most boots on the ground psychiatrists they may not have the time to do it. Maybe you stumble across it, go, "Oh, that's interesting," and move on. Um, and and then when you get to let's say the more authoritative guidelines, things like the APA guidelines and stuff like that, they're completely silent on the topic. And that might be a document that someone goes to. So one way to shut it down is to just not mention it. And then you have to say, you know, what might be the reasons why you know authoritative groups, universities, educators of mental health practitioners and therapists, why wouldn't they want to talk about this? And something that at least I felt while I was going through training and uh, is that there is this, I mean, there's almost an intimidation uh, that comes out there when there's, when you're constantly being bombarded with things that say, don't stigmatize depression, don't stigmatize bipolar disorder. And, and, you know, people will say these things to you when you, when you're talking about the risks of, of these medications, they will try and cast you in a light like you are some kind of part of some organization that just has, a bone to pick with medication, you, you know, that you're just of the impression that people just shouldn't be on meds that pull themselves up there like the, by their bootstraps. Cause that's the way I did it. And I'm just going to force my perspective on everyone else. So they write you off. They say that you've got some kind of agenda and then they accuse you of stigmatizing mental illness. Right. And so, so, so that's the, I, I, and I don't know where this came from. Maybe you could share it, but it's palpable. It, it is palpable going through training that, you know, you don't don't knock the sacred cow of medication because if you do, you're stigmatizing mental illness, and you're gonna and people are gonna come off their meds and they're gonna commit suicide, and it's gonna be on you. So yeah, yeah. I think this is combination of intimidation and also just silence on the matter, and and, and I guess that that comes from what what people want to fund. You know, they, they want to fund certain narratives and certain perspectives, and then that just the, the, the global pressure comes in. Yeah, what, what do you think about that? Well, you know, this is this is so true. I mean, if you go back, um, one of the reasons that they they kill the messenger, so to speak, or they ostracize the lep- is mm-hmm. and, and sort of discredit that person, is because in fact they don't have the evidence base to argue from. So you know, they really can't go and say, "Wait a minute, look how good our trials are. Look at how effective these drugs are, safe and long term outcomes." They really don't have that. So because they can't, even though they're saying they're evidence-based, that's part of their self-image, they really can't argue on the science because it's out of sync with their own thinking, actually. And then, if, and now what you're talking about is psychiatry, well, we can talk about all these things, but psychiatry sort of became a tribe <laughs> because mm-hmm. of these vulnerabilities. And right from what you say, like within the, the training programs, they make it clear, like, you're going to join this tribe. And 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 we know, and part of it is the people who criticize us are biased, right? They're, it's always the outsiders that are biased, et cetera. They and and they're not they're not thoughtful, you know, they're not caring for people because of the stigma thing. So that is part of the training of mental health professionals. And it's not just in psychiatry, it's done to psychologists, counselors today as well. Don't break with the tribe. And because there's also thought is where are you gonna work? Right. Mm-hmm. Because most of these systems have a, a narrative for how they operate and you've got to be part of that narrative. So I think what you have here and then I'll talk about the historical 
precedent for this is it's it's like a, a, a vulnerable tribe called a guild, but it operates as a tribe. And the way they kept going was to ostracize, push out people who who started criticizing that story. Look what happened to Healy. You can look, you can see it over and over again that the people who said, wait a minute, they got pushed out. Mm-hmm. And also, you know, Peter Goyche, uh, uh in yeah, in yeah. You no, know, he got he he got kicked out of the Cochrane collaboration. Yeah. Now he's he's a radical guy in the way he just like the way he speaks and all. He does, he does, you know, he's, he's like a wrecking a, ball, you know. He's a and wrecking I love ball. It. Yeah, <laughs> so he doesn't yeah. mince his words at all. Yeah. But it wasn't until he criticized psychiatry that he started being pushed out. So, yeah. and I think it's because they couldn't respond. Now, where well, did this- let, 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 before you jump in there, I wanted to just tack on something to this point because uh, you know I want to talk about you know it's 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 not just psychiatrists you know and you know since my training in residency you know i've i've worked in corporations i've obviously i worked at the fda and i've worked in pharmaceutical companies so i know how organizations think and work and and this is something that i think everyone in the audience would probably relate to you know if you've been in kind of these situations it doesn't serve you to go against the grain you in fact <laughs> will make your life more complicated you know, if I'm working, you know, it, it, and this happened to me as a resident, if I'm saying, you know, hey, attending physician, this guy, you know, you just put on more antipsychotic, it actually has akathisia from from the antipsychotic medication that they're read, they're already on. That's not going to go down well. You know, that's that's going to end up. Um, you know, you might you might come across someone who's like, oh, tell me more, Yosef. But by and large. People are busy. They're trying to get through their day. They have their kind of agenda and they didn't need to knock out 10 patients in the morning. And they're just going to say, who are you to question me? So, you know, it's, 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 it's this kind of broad, um, I, I think it applies to anyone when you kind of work in these organizations that are kind of hierarchical that you, it's, you either get in line or you get out, you know, that that's kind of what happens. <laughs> yeah. Listen, I mean, if, if this is the story of whistleblowers, right? Whistleblowers yeah. always end up getting killed. I mean, not, not literally. But <laughs> metaphorically, they end up getting killed yeah. right? because, and it doesn't even matter if they're right. It doesn't matter when the corruption surfaces. Mm-hmm. You want a team player, and the sort of uh, collective needs team players, and they need team players even more when they're doing some things that aren't really up to snuff. That's when they yeah. really. I mean, that's one of the things with psychi- this institutional corruption is, mm-hmm. is that as institutions stray from what is expected to be their public service or their, you know. Mm-hmm. Their, their their moral behavior. People who start saying that, if if once the institution starts to shift, they're going to push those people out. The whistleblowers get killed. I mean, mm-hmm. metaphorically. So yeah, I mean, this is one of the problems is that, and it's not just psychiatry, and it's not just, of course, medicine. But medicine, we we have this cherished idea that they're open, they can change their minds, you know, they can. But you know, all of medicine, I think it training so much today is training smart people to accept whatever is seen as the dogma of the day yep. and, you know, mm-hmm. and, and feel good about like, Oh, we're the ones with knowledge, but you, they, you take these very, I was at Harvard medical school, uh, director of publications for a couple of years, take these really bright, curious people sometimes, and you turn them into automatons sort of like the, the people who can regurgitate whatever the common wisdom is. And so often, it's not just psychiatry you don't see the whole patient. Uh, last time I went to a doctor, I, I, I don't generally go to doctors, but last time I yeah. went, he was so busy. He had no, I had no idea was. He got down there. He, he, he got on his computer to see who I was, talked to me, never looked up from his computer. I told him what was going on. And then he said, okay, someone will come in. And then he hurried off. He never looked at me. Yeah. <laughs> you know, never saw me in the face. And I'm like, this is like medicine 101. But anyway, I, I, I'm wandering here. I just want to yeah. say is, this way of thinking of social behavior it is the problem is it leads to bad medicine. It mm-hmm. really does because it's the human beings are so complex and so idiosyncratic. But it is a problem that is pervasive in American medicine today. You know, how guidelines are set. Uh, how we say what's an illness, what is not an illness, that whole thing. I mm-hmm. want to go back to one thing you said about yes. how they treated critics as the other, as threats. You really see this going on in 1992, because, and, and this is one of the sort of most unfortunate things about this whole story. So, you know, Prozac comes to market, and there is some worry that these drugs, Prozac, can stir 
akathisia or homicidal impulses, suicidal impulses. And then there was uh, Jonathan Cole at M, uh, you know, mm -hmm. at H, he does his healthy volunteer study. And he says, yeah, we had, I think, six people who had stirred <laughs> homicidal or suicidal impulses in who were ordinary people. So this presented a challenge to Prozac. And if you look at the FDA documents that were sent back to Eli Lilly, they said, oh, this can kill Prozac if this gets out of hand, this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And then you hear it. So what does, what does Eli Lilly do? It calls in its thought leaders, including, um, oh, why am I drawing a blank on his name? Ro uh, uh, from MGH, Rosen. It's Rosenbaum, I don't know. Is that yeah, it? something like that. He's a, he yeah. was the chair of the department, but he mm. was also Mr. Prozac. And they had a meeting that you can see, and they said, ah, oh, we'll say this complaint is coming from the Scientologists, because the Scientologists were gathering, uh, you know, these uh, adverse event reports sent to, sent to the MedWatch program. So what they knew is, with that thing, they had a strategy for linking criticism to this crazy cult. Mm -hmm. So the fact that Scientology got involved with this was so damaging because it gave such a a knee-jerk way to dismiss dismiss this and say people that make criticisms, oh, they're like Scientologists or they are Scientologists. So, and that became the thought within the larger community society became within, um, you know, uh, mainstream media and all. The critics were Scientologists, and that really shut things down. And they played that card for like twenty years, the Scientology yeah. card. Yeah, and if you mentioned anything about antidepressants making people suicidal you're putting people at risk because you were scaring them off the medication and, you know, right. exposing them to the danger of their underlying condition. Where if you, if you look, you know, and, and this is just epidemiology, you know, just published in the FDA labels. I mean, I mean, this is something that's interesting. I don't, I don't even know like how we can prescribe these medications to children without some, you know, without having done absolutely everything else first, because when you look at the data, you know, on a population level, you have more suicide attempts uh, in the in the groups that are treated. And it's, you know, okay, sure, you know, it, it decreases your depression, you know, as measured by on a scale. But when you look at the real outcome there, you'd probably want less suicide attempts. Um, I mean, so there's this, this, there's something in there that's just really, really bizarre, especially when it comes to the populations under age 25. Um, but yeah, yeah, I, I mean, it's a, it, you know this whole, you know this whole, I this whole suicide thing. You know, like you said, in 1992, it took until 2006 until there was a boxed warning. Until then, they shut it down, and anyone who had a drug-induced kind of akathisia and became suicidal, they probably had their dose doubled. You know, right. and because they were like, you know, this this doesn't happen, it can't increase suicide, and it, 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 you could imagine how many families that ruined by by, yeah. Oh, listen, mm. you know, and of course, one of the big uh, one of the sort of poster, you know, poster for um, corruption was what is it? Study three 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 twenty three. I think that's it. Three two nine. David Healy. Three two nine. Sorry. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. They, you know, they had suicidal events in the in the drug treated group, and they hid that. They spun it, and they tried to make it placebo, and and you know that helps form this idea that, oh, they, they're not causing, increasing the risk of suicide in, in, in kids. And there was also the same thing with some fudging with the Prozac data on the uh, TAD study. If you look at the, have you ever looked at the TAD study? Yeah. Yeah, I have. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what did they say? They said there was no evidence of an increase in risk on, on, on Prozac, correct? Mm -hmm. That's in the abstract. Do you know actually what happened? Because there's a graphic in there that tells you whether people were on Prozac when they uh, attempted suicide or not. Now, what happened was, so 18 of 19 attempted suicides were on Prozac. So how did they say it was the same? The way it was designed was you had people coming in randomized to placebo or to cognitive behavior therapy without drug. And then mm -hmm. after six weeks, uh, they were then put on drug. Now, if they attempted suicide after they were put on drug, they still charted up as a, a placebo group suicide attempt so that's how they came up with the tads thing saying oh there's no extra signal of suicide with prozac when in fact it was like 18 of 19 suicide attempts were people on drug and, and on placebo i don't think there was a single suicide 
when while they're on placebo. I think there was one on, on CBT. Now, after that study was published, I know a woman whose son broke up with her, a 17-year-old son, broke up with her his girlfriend, first love and all that, became depressed. She took him to a psychiatrist. Psychiatrist said, we're going to give him Prozac. She said, wait a minute, isn't that a problem? He said, no, we have this TAD study. There's no increased risk. He hung himself like two weeks later. Mm -hmm. And then when we published the real TADS data on Mad in America, she was unbelievably devastated is the only way to say it. Yeah, no, I, I'm, understandably. The, you know, the one thing I wanted to add on the antidepressant suicide research was how, you know, the narrative was spun that this was something that you could only figure out with statistical significance at a population level. And what I mean by that is, you know, 100 people on one arm, 100 people on another arm, you know, which group had more suicides um, or suicide attempts, you know, you'd have to look at um, those two numbers and compare them and see if the magnitude of difference was, was large enough. David Healy was the first person to start talking about, you could just look at the person, you know, you could say, all right, the way they're changing after being on the medication is so out of character to their normal condition you know, that, that this must be drug induced. And, you know, there's a reason, you know, all drugs can have paradoxical effects and there may be a certain group of people who are not suited to this and et cetera. Um, and, you know, oh, and by the way, when I took them off the medication or when others have taken them off the medication, it's gone away. And when they've been re-exposed, they've gone into this dysphoric agitation, which could logic, you know, which could precipitate someone into suicide. To this day, that's still the best way to understand this. And and what was promoted was like, oh, we need more meta-analyses. We need more pooling of studies. And the, and the thing is, that's how most people think of it to this day, but it actually doesn't make sense because let's say, you know, antidepressants, they can have a therapeutic effect, at least in the short term, by mood constriction. So it's very possible that the drug actually in, decreases suicide attempts in a, in a large section of that population. And maybe in just a handful of them, it causes it. If you're going to look at things at a population level, I mean, you could get, you know, 10 suicides on a placebo arm with like 100 people. And, you know, and you might even have just two suicides on the antidepressant treatment arm. But one of those people still could have been drug induced, you know, because you have this, this differential effect. I mean, so it's ridiculous. I mean, that, but that was the way that. Eli Lilly dismissed it for so long, you know, we can't see the difference at the population level. And it was just, it was the wrong analysis. And, and they were so successful in promoting that idea and getting people to publish about it in that way and say, it's still uncertain. We need more data. We need more this and that, but it, um, I don't know, to me, it's a good example about how you can just grab a hold of it and just say, you, this is what you need to look for. And, it, and, and Healy was right about it the whole time from the, from yeah. the beginning. Yeah. You know, I think what you're saying here is so important for and how yeah. you practice medicine, right? Yeah. You know, it's not like everybody responds the same to medicines, right? And especially no. psychiatric medicine. There's a spectrum of outcomes. By the way, you see that spectrum of outcomes, of course, in the in the in the data, right? Mm -hmm. Some responders, some good responders, some non-responders, some worsening of people. So if you really wanted uh, clinical trials, and especially if trials were done in real world patients to be a guide to good clinical practice, the message wouldn't be these are effective for everyone, right? Mm -hmm. We'll treat all people the same. You still need to be cognizant. Is it helping your patient? And if mm -hmm. you're getting the sort of thing that you're talking about, you've got someone who's worsening in response to it. So you need to be alert to that, but you're right. Now, I, I think what happened is this was, this was done not by accident, of course, by pharmaceutical companies. They wanted their drugs to be seen as, at, at, a, at a sort of base level as decreasing suicide or not causing mm -hmm. suicide. So they, they, they hide behind that sort of statistical population level data or, you know, these meta-analyses, these are the final word, as if meta-analyses deliver a, 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 a clinical protocol, a clinical practice for everyone. They don't. This is part mm -hmm. of the, I think the real problem with medicine is, and it's it's not just psychiatry, but in psychiatry, it's particularly so because there is no, you know, unifying pathology, right? And, and, and for whatever reasons, people have such different responses to these drugs. And the message should be just as you say, figure out who benefits, 
Who doesn't and who worsens? And that means you've got to be paying attention. And the suicide is such a great example because you're right. Maybe it saves some people from suicide. In other words, you know, they get dead yeah. and they suicide. Fantastic. But then if you have three out of 100 who are now becoming suicidal, you got to protect those people. I mean, on the mm -hmm. drug. This is yeah. an example of a moral failure you've highlighted that this, just, this is a story of how medicine needs to change and how psychiatry needs to change. You know, another thing that, that comes to my mind, which which I, I want to bring up is, I guess, the public probably has an impression that the doctors understand the type of data, you know, the clinical trial design and the, and the kind of data analyses that go along with it. These things are incredibly difficult to understand. I mean, these are graduate level courses that you would do for a couple of years to understand the kind of meta-analyses and epidemiology and clinical trial design to do these. So most of what doctors would hear is this drug is safe and effective for the treatment of major depressive disorder in pediatric populations. And they go, that's fine. And and they go with it. They, they don't say, well, actually, what was your primary outcome? Okay. So you used the HAMD, a uh, depression scale. Is there anything about, you know, whether they do better in their relationships or do better in their jobs or have more satisfaction about life? Is there anything in there about how they do at year three? You know, and if they ask these questions, the answer is no. You know, it's it's they know how they do up to you know, six weeks, if you're lucky, it's up to maybe like six months if it's a particularly long study, but that's incredibly rare. And so, you know, all they hear is safe and effective. And then they look at the authorship line and go, oh, you know, the chairman of the Department of Psychiatry, okay. where I used to go, is is one of the authors here, um, you know. And so I'm just going to go with it, you know, and, and, and that makes sense. And, you know, if there's a paper out there you know, bashing, you know, David Healy or others who are talking about some of the risks. And it's, again, got this kind of authorship line there. You go, well, I guess I'm just going to believe these people because who am I to go against the chairman of psychiatry at my institution or some other place? It's like, you know, and and, and this kind of trickles into clinical practice. And I want to, you know, the, the, the guide, you know, you wrote a really nice chapter in uh, psychiatry under the influence on the antidepressant guidelines and, and you know how they just how they just leave things out, which I think is great. But people like you could have a patient that that comes in and they're suicidal, and you know it, the guideline in the U.S. says you know first line treatment is an antidepressant, you know medication. And maybe maybe they're already on an antidepressant. There is so much literature and support out there saying you know maybe put them on an antipsychotic because that's what you do for treatment resistant depression. But there is next to no authoritative guidelines with authorship lines of chairmen of psychiatry, which will tell you how to effectively treat someone who's having a drug-induced akathisia or suicide. You know, you are on your own. So, so you, you're tasked with making this decision. Well, maybe it's a drug problem or maybe it's treatment-resistant depression. Well, you know, as we mentioned before, you know, with the diagnosis in psychiatry, it could be whatever you want it to be technically, you know, as long as it... It's one of those things. I actually also think because of the amount, the imbalance in the research saying treat, 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 more people just go that way because it feels supported. It feels like, you know, if, if, if I get hauled into court one day, I could say, well, they had these symptoms and, you know, all of these people said I should put them on, you know, Abilify now and I'm just acting within these guidelines and, you know, there's, there's nothing that says the other part of it. And so, I mean, that that's another pervasive problem I see with just the imbalance and the amount of research on efficacy. And there's just like nothing on risk to, that people could hang their hat on and feel confident following. Yeah. I mean, I think this is what, you know, the research that is churned out and what the money flow is is meant to do. And, you know, if you're an academic research your money flows to you, it doesn't flow to you for highlighting risks. It flows to you for highlighting, you know, benefits, and then you can go on these talks and all that sort of thing, and you and you get the, you know, you have the prestige of writing guidelines and that sort of thing. Yeah, this is this is such a problem in that in that there are there's a machinery for turning out um, turning out stories of treat 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 or guide. You know, this is this is what you need to do, and there's no machinery for saying, wait a minute, are you causing harm? There's just nothing in, in to sort of in any sort of large scale way that really uh, uh, addresses that concern. And the other thing is, if I'm a prescriber and and I do what is I'm told to do, I have no vulnerability, right? Mm -hmm. Like I suicide, that's fine. 
I mean, I'm just saying that's that becomes I did what I was supposed to do, and all the problems exactly. then uh, go to the patient and stuff. But you know the case that was in um, that was it a Ch Ch Chestnut Hill case, you know, in the 1990s, where someone did not they did not give a depressed person uh, and and a depressed yeah 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 you know I heard well, about that one. Well, yep. this was really key because I think it's Chestnut Lodge is what it was. Um, mm -hmm. They had a long history with psy psychoanalysis and that sort of thing, which, uh, this old way of doing things. And they had this person, why I can't remember his name, come in. He didn't get better under the psychotherapy. And then he complained that I would have gotten better on the antidepressant. Now, what happened was the APA at this time loved this lawsuit because they saw it as a way to kill psychotherapy and really mm -hmm. consolidate around just doing giving the drugs that this would be what we psychopharmacologists do but that was a real message to people like not treating with drug exposes you to vulnerabilities and to lawsuits whereas you treat your your home free and i there's a you know i wrote about a while back there's this initiative in norway where um the health minister ordered every there's four health districts in in, in norway to set aside some beds within the hospital for people who wanted medication-free treatment, okay? And there was an idea that a, there should be agency among the patients, and if they want medication-free, we should still provide it. Anyway, there was this guy, a, a couple of psychiatric nurses. They set up a private hospital, and they began getting – basically, the people who would get referred to them were people who just failed within the regular system. They would be on like <laughs> 30 drugs, 20 drugs they'd come to. Anyway, I went there uh, – the, they were getting people off. And, and as you know, when you have someone on 10 drugs, and you start tapering them down. They often come alive, right? They treated 660 patients, okay, of chronic people. People have been hospitalized for years. They had one suicide in six years. Well, then there was a big stink about the suicide. Because basically, Norwegian psychiatry said, aha, we can like now nail them on the suicide. And a paper ran, a newspaper ran like, oh, you know, they had a they had a person die on when they were tapering him down. Well, how many suicides are happening within the regular hospital system? They happen all the mm -hmm. time. But they use that and now they shut down that place because of this attack. So, you know, just to add something here, we do exist within a capitalistic society, right? Yeah. And yeah. a lot of money flow for treatment. And there's, you know, that whole thing, you know, what is it? What do we spend on healthcare in this country? Like 20% of our GDP now or something like mm -hmm. that crazy? Well, that's all about treat, 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 treat. And then if you look at it from that point of view, doctors, prescribers are just cogs in that machinery, that big sort of capitalistic machinery. And talking about risks and harms and treating people less, boy, there's just no financial reward for that. There's financial vulnerability and there's professional vulnerability. And you know how human beings behave it's hard mm -hmm. then to get them to do something that goes against their self-interest at some point. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's that, that, that's so true. Um, Can I ask you a question so, real quickly? Sure. Yep. You, you help people get off benzodiazepines, right? Yeah. And do you help people get off antidepressants? Yes. And how vulnerable do you feel for doing that? You know, here, here's the interesting thing about me, and, it, and it's it's probably why I why I do this work. You know, because I've you know because I've gone to places like the FDA where I you know I was doing safety there. You know, I was writing drug labels. I know the literature inside and out about these risks, and um, I, I also you know I've you know I'm a drug safety specialist in a pharmaceutical company. I guess I to me I came to peace with the fact that if I was to get called into court. I would probably know more than the opposing expert there. I mean, they could probably find someone there, but you know, the way, the way I see things, you know, if they're, you know, it's, I think I could defend myself, you know, just because I have, you know, I'm a professional uh, adverse reaction, you know, kind of detector. That's, that's, that's my day trade, you know, uh, doing, doing that. So there's, there's certainly risk, but then the other thing is, you know, probably the riskiest cases are folks that are on antipsychotic medications, you know, who want to come off those because they're cause more problems than, than, than the other group. And really when it comes to it, 
I think it's 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 about documentation and getting the family on board. I like to think about it. You know, what would I need if if something went awry? And you know, I'd usually need someone's spouse to say, "Yeah, you know, I'm sub- totally supportive of them doing this." You know, you know, my, the, the 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 patient she does she doesn't want to be on the medication anymore. It's causing terrible weight gain. She doesn't really feel like it's helping her, and we no longer consent to day you know to to everyday treatment. In fact, we would like her to be off it and to use it as needed. And, you know, if I could put together something like that and, and, and they're on board for that kind of treatment plan, I feel like it's fairly defensible, um, you know, to say, hey, for this individual patient, daily use wasn't working and, and we just decided that we would, you know, treat the outburst. So so that's that side of it. And honestly, I also, you know, when, when it comes to the people who have antidepressants, most of them already have you know, severe withdrawal symptoms and just a debilitated and they just want to come off. And it, But it's the same protocol. We try and get, get family involvement in there. We do the traditional things that every psychiatrist would do, you know, limit access to lethal means and, you know, frequent visits if they're, you know, in high risk. But I actually feel it's okay. And I hope other people feel, feel it's more okay to do this kind of work in the future. <laughs> Well, no, yeah. you know, there's such a, I, we hear, we, I get emails all the time from people saying, who can I go see? And sometimes mm-hmm. I have trouble finding a, a, a prescriber, you know, a psychiatrist who will support them with, for, through withdrawal. I mean, we hear all the time how hard it is to find people who will support them in this way. Well, I'm pleased to say I'm licensed in probably like 14 states now. So I'll give you a list of those um, uh, after this. So you can send people my way if you'd like. Oh, I would like to. That'd be great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, the other thing I was going to say, um, my thought came back to me, which I lost earlier on, you were talking about, there's no, there's no machinery to get information out there about risks. And this is just so true. And I, I, I think it's interesting for people to realize that within pharmaceutical companies, there's a group called medical affairs, you know, they're closely linked to commercial and their job is to anticipate the concerns that providers are going to have about the drugs. So if they're concerned about a, you know, a side effect, you know, they, or, or, or maybe there's a new population that's not kind of on label, but they need to kind of, you know, maybe the drug has been effective in some case reports, that group will get that information out there. And so its whole agenda is to spin things in a positive light and diminish concern. But the, the you know, if, they're not going to publish a manuscript on a side effect because, you know, I've been in companies and when this has come up, you know, they go, oh, we don't want to blow this out of proportion. You know, we don't want to make this a bigger deal than it, that, than it is, you know, and, and you would think that there would be a check and balance that someone at the FDA or, you know, heads of journals would say, hey, for every efficacy paper you put out, you need to publish one on the risks. There's no check and balance. And so there's just a deluge of articles generated from within pharmaceutical companies with authorship lines of, you know, the people they used in their clinical trials who are already, you know, very on board with the drug, you know, spinning, you know, positive stories about the drug, diminishing negative ones. And there's, you know, no investment in in those stories. And so, again, that's like, that, that's just another way that you just get this heavy skewing of, uh, you know, that the drugs don't have any harms. Yeah, you know, you see every once in a while, I think there's a Journal of International Risk and Safety or something called mm-hmm. that sometimes looks at this. And then uh, there's Thomas More's group. What is it? What does he put out? Quarter Watch or something like that. I forget what it was. Mm-hmm. Men Watch. But other than that, there's not even, you know, there's not much mining of the Med Watch, you know, adverse events database. And it just doesn't, it, you know, it, it, what's so funny to me is, of course, the advertisements. <laughs> on tv yeah. they have to list like five minutes of advertisements but we're so attuned to saying oh those are just rare risk or something like that and we just tune it out so yeah i mean this is part of a big societal problem is that you know i, I don't know are there any medications that don't have any adverse effects or possible side effects i don't know yeah but it's just we, we, we still sort of have a magic bullet conception of things that like um the drugs work drugs work and there's mm-hmm. side effects there or whatever and, and 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 you know at a public health level where is the advance in public health with the increase in spending 
You don't see, you don't you certainly don't see an advance in public health outcomes for psychiatric disorders, but it's also, you know, like longevity, diabetes, um, so many problems. We don't see an improvement in public health as we use more and more drugs. No, no, it's in fact, there's, you know, there's this opportunity cost at the individual level for being on a drug because you just think it's going to solve your problem rather than, yeah. I don't know, making the changes that you need, you know, it, you know, for the chap I talked about earlier on, you know, who thought he was depressed for, you know, his twenties. I mean, it just, it completely demoralizing, uh, you know, conceptualization of what's going on with you. Oh, you have a mental illness rather than, Hey, let's have a look at some of the things that aren't working. Maybe I need to, you know, stop this bad habit or stop seeing these people, but it's, yeah, no, there's no. So, so you know, yeah, this all goes back to this story of what narrative do we, you know, in our society, do we organize ourselves around? And you have mm-hmm. a narrative that exaggerates safety and efficacy and what drugs do and a narrative mm-hmm. that doesn't look at the risk, doesn't bring that information forward. Gosh, the, the amount of, but, you know, in my line of work, you know, when I, cause, cause people come to me when they've had injuries, that that's, that's my typical patient. It's not someone who's just like, oh, I just want to come off, you know, safely, you know, they beat a path to my door when something has gone terribly wrong and the amount of betrayal that they feel, um, from, you know, from their doctors, you know, sometimes it's young people who have been almost coerced into taking medication during their adolescence by their parents who thought that they were really helping them. And then now they've developed, you know, severe problems from the antidepressants. I mean, it's just, I mean, it's, it's the saddest stories ever, you know, lives, lives just destroyed by this narrative. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, we have, we, we see this all the time at Madden American. Of course we publish personal stories Mm -hmm. in it. It is, it is a story of lives destroyed and people feeling betrayed because of what they were told. So we've, we've, we're about, we're out. I mean, we've kind of blown through the hour a little bit, but I hope, I hope you don't mind me asking you just one more question. Sure. Um, so, so, you know, after, after you did psychiatry under the influence, um, it's been a bit since then. What, what are you doing with your time now? You know, where, where are your efforts going these days? Yeah, you know, so um, I did start Mad in America, this website, and we have daily science reports and we have personal stories and all. And uh, I sometimes write reports for them that look into like what, you know, update reports, the long term effects. Or I did a story about uh, suicide in the age of Prozac, looking at some of these questions. So I, I, I still do have my hand in that. And then I'll give you another example of one thing I did is. You know, the story was that antipsychotics lengthen life, right? This is why you should give them. Even though, like, in any cohorts, that they diminish, you know, they increase mortality. But somehow this became the thing, oh, we should prescribe antipsychotics to psychotic people because it, it reduces mortality. Anyway, I did a piece on that. It's in, uh, is an example where I try to keep my hand in, like, what is the evidence base? But what has happened really is that in America really took off. And so we now have affiliates in 11 countries and we're going to be affiliates in four more countries. So 15 affiliates and and the shared mission is really, you know, societies organize themselves around a false narrative. And we try to provide information that, you know, gives a more honest narrative and includes patient voices in it. And, but we have, uh, you know, we have podcasts now and we have uh, for a long while, we had a continuing education arm. So, and of course I have to raise the money to keep this going. So that's the problem. I mean, what I'm really doing now is, I mean, I say it's a problem because I would love to go back to writing books. I love writing books. Mm-hmm. And not just about psychiatry. <laughs> it's writing a book sometimes is like, a, a, it, it's like such a learning experience, such a, a, a way to indulge your curiosity. It's like the best thing imaginable. And I, I miss that. But unfortunately, the, you know, un- or unfor- unfortunately and fortunately, unfortunately in the sense of my writing career mm-hmm. took me over, but fortunately in the sense that I do think what we're doing is important, that, you know, even a sort of a societal level of trying to give people a different narrative to, to know about. I mean, you asked, for example, you know, maybe finding someone that help you could fish out all this information about, say, drug risk and what was finding. Well, we try to do that five times a week and, you know, you can go mm-hmm. on our and really find it so that's what i'm doing and and 
just to finish this up is you were talking about how many lives have really been destroyed and harmed and diminished because of this narrative. And, and the way we're raising our kids is just the, the idea you would have 20 to 25% of your kids on psychiatric drugs is just astonishing. I mean, it, and there's no evidence you're helping these kids grow up. There's all plenty of evidence you're helping them, you're screwing them up physically, emotionally, socially. Stunting and, their growth. Stunting yeah. their growth and, they, and there's even this thing yeah. that two year olds need to be on stimulants, which just shows that, like, the, 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 the narrative is just insane. Um, so, it's it's meaningful work to sort of try to correct this narrative and, and and help provide other information. So that's what I'm doing. I mean, something was really interesting. Again, the chap I was talking to about PSSD legitimately had questions about his sexual identity because he struggled so much to maintain sexual arousal when he was with women that he thought he was attracted to. I mean, it could you? I mean, I mean, this is just one story, but could you imagine? You know, you know, kids. 12, 13 years old who haven't really reached sexual maturity, who have been maintained on these medications, having, you know, having to go through everything that's already so confusing about adolescence, but with, you know, with, with that thrown in there as well. I mean, it's, 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 you know, the more, the more I think about it, the more depressed I get about it, just how, how nasty it is. Yeah. It's throwing off, you know, what I, the way I like to describe it is, we were sort of born with a, and I'm not a religious person, but I'm going to use this with a God-given right to try to make something out of ourselves as we grow mm -hmm. up, and that be, and that includes trying to become somewhat comfortable with our minds because they're often you know strange places, you know you experience your own mind in a strange way, but that's sort of the existential path in life, and that's sort of the great voyage we're on. And when you medicate people, and that means like you know dealing with sexuality and having all those sort of tumults around sexuality. Mm -hmm. and part of the way of course you the process of moving from a preteen to an adult is so much about that and we're robbing kids of that we're robbing mm -hmm. them of the chance to decide who they're going to be and, and 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 to go through difficulties and see themselves as human beings that struggle and 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 have all these ups and downs with sexuality and too and 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 you know, powerful urges, urges, passions, jealousies, that's all part of being human. And we're robbing our kids of that. And I know nothing that is, it, 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 it's hard to say the level of harm that is, or the level of sort of existential harm that is being done to kids who get pathologized in this way. Yeah. No, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a nightmare. Um, well, I want to say thank you so much uh, for coming on. You know, it's my first time talking to you. It's an absolute pleasure to meet you. And um, uh, pleasure's on mine. But now and, you're going to return. You're going to return it. We're going to have you on Mad America. Yeah, I'd love that. And uh, yeah, so so definitely uh, stay in touch. And um, I look forward to talking with you more. Yeah, me too. I look forward to continuing the conversation. Yeah. You'll let me know when this runs, right? Um, probably in like three or four days is usually okay, the turnaround we'll time. We'll put a link to it on Mad America. Okay. All right. Okay. Good. Great. Thanks, Thanks Bob. So much. Take care. Really nice Bye. to meet you. Yeah.